See, first, here are some comments on the homework coming back. Uh, so, the homework being returned. This is a good assignment, mostly you did really well on it. It's one of the more difficult assignments because you're actually getting your getting your hands dirty computing with these coset or factor groups and that's in general not easy. Um, let's see, on the extra sheet, uh, problem number three, you asked whether or not uh, is A L equal to L A for all Well, you're asked to determine whether or not the subgroup is normal. I mean, that's the question just rephrased. And what some of you said was AL is not equal to LA for all A and G. This is how some of you answered the question. And technically, this is not a correct answer. You're asked to determine whether or not the left cosets are always equal to the right cosets. It turns out, folks, sometimes they are. It's just not always. When you make this statement, what you've told me is that they never are equal. And that's not a correct statement because, for instance, E times L does equal L times E. So the correct statement is not that one. It's AL is not equal to LA for some A and G, and therefore L is not normal. Because the negation of are the two equal always is are they not? All right, let's see. Um, yeah, second comment coming back. I've started to abbreviate this phrase because I'm using it relatively often, maybe more often than I'd like to see. If you see this, folks, A slash O means apples and oranges. It means what you've done is you've somehow told me Something like, well, something like things that we talked about when I returned the assignment uh, last time, a week ago. Maybe you said something like kernel phi equals one, so that you've somehow told me that a set equals a number, something like that. Or that you've told me something like a collection of numbers equals a group, or just something that can't be true simply because you're trying to compare two things that, well, one of which looks like apples and the other looks like oranges. And this happened this, similarly on this assignment. In a couple of situations like the one I just mentioned, you'll say something like kernel of phi equals one, or the number of elements in the kernel of phi is the number of elements, or anyway. All right, let's see. Um, ah, yeah. A couple of additional comments. Uh, in question 1C on the sheet, uh, some of you correctly said D4 slash K is isomorphic to V. That's a true statement. But tell me why it is. In a previous problem, you were asked to look at D4 mod some other subgroup. And in that situation, you got a group. The factor group had only two elements. Well, folks, once you get a group of two elements, then there's no issues involved. There is only one group having two elements. It's Z2. But when you look at D4 mod K, group with four elements. And when you get a group with four elements, then you know there's a choice. Just looking at the group table, it's not clear right away whether or not you're looking at V or whether you're looking at Z4. So what you need to do is at least tell me enough, but why? Specifically, why is it not? Z4, for example. That's a group of four elements. Heck, it's an abelian group of four elements. So what you need to do is tell me enough to distinguish the group that you've got from the group Z4. All you need to do is say, look on the main diagonal, every element has square equal to itself, and therefore, since Z4 doesn't have that property, it's V. So there's really not much to say, but something needs to be said before you can simply conclude that the answer is V or Z2 cross Z2, they're the same thing. And the final comment is the style comment. But it turned, well, it's probably uber style. It's more than just a style comment. Let me 
show you what most of your proofs look like for the statement if g is abelian then g slash h, g mod h is abelian. Most of your proofs look like a h star b h equals a b h equals b a h equals b h star a h. These three equations or four expressions connected by three equations contain all of the mathematical content that you need to have written down a correct proof. But here's what some of you did. Some of you wrote the phrase since G is abelian, comma, that. Folks, you've made three different statements here. You've told me this equals this, and this equals this, and this equals this. Okay, which one of those equations is the one that somehow follows from the fact that G is abelian? Is it this equals this? Is it this equals this? Uh -uh. In fact, it's the middle one. So in fact, what some others of you did was you wrote that same phrase out here. So that you wrote the proof AH star BH is that is that. Not good style. Why? Because the equality that you're verifying or justifying because G is abelian is this one. That's how you're getting from ABH to BAH. So the style statement is if you're going to tell me that you're getting from one step to the next by using one of the hypotheses, point exactly to where you're using it. Don't just give me four statements and say, well, it's true because G is abelian. Which one is true because G is abelian? Now, if you wanted to write that on the end and put the you know, arrow here, that's fine. Or if you wanted to, as some of you did, put it above the equal sign, great idea. That's where it belongs. Or if you wanted to write it in front, just draw an arrow to why or which of the statements is. But just putting it here and then listing out three or four equations just isn't good style because you haven't specified which of the statements or which of the equations you've justified by using the hypothesis that G is abelian. All right. That's the homework stuff. Let me give you the exam prep stuff here. Um, for those of you that are watching the video or online, I'll post all this stuff to the website by tomorrow. I just have to scan it and put it in electronic form to get it back to you. So let's see. Let me just do this. One, two, three. So give me a minute or so here. Two. We'll do this a little bit backwards. That's all right. Four. Oops, sorry about that one. Six. Eight. Ten. See, sir, I'm just going to have you pass these back. I think. There you go. Um, next. Just, uh, I'll just pass these back to you. One, two, three, four. There you go. I'll just pass these back to you. One, two, three, four. Actually, that's much more efficient. One, two, three. Here, Devin, pass those straight back. One, two, three, actually. One, two. You pass those back for me, thank you. And then here is the. There you go. Pass those back to there. One, two, three, one, two, three. Okay. How do we do here? Everybody's got three documents now? Yeah. Okay. Exam two info. Well, hey, I mean, it looks. Bad joke looks isomorphic to exam one info, right? And it's the same structure here. You, here's the date, here's the sections it'll cover, here's what you need to know, and we'll go from there. And I've given you the practice exam, which is the exam that I gave last year. Will exam two this year look similar to practice exam two? Sure it will. Will it look as similar as exam one looked to practice exam one? Yeah, close. I mean, if you if you've really 
got a good understanding of what's happening on practice exam two, you'll probably do pretty well on real exam two, but don't get tunnel vision here. Just because there's questions on the practice exam doesn't mean that the same or similar questions will necessarily show up on the exam. And conversely, there certainly might be questions on exam two that, the real exam two that don't look like they have any direct, you know, corresponding questions on the practice exam. But if you do all the, you know, sort of redo all the homework, make sure you've got all the homework stuff under your belt, and you go back through in your notes and make sure that you've picked out all of the, you know, key ideas that we studied in here. So in, in case there's some true-false questions or sort of big-picture questions, then you should be completely well prepared for exam two. All right. Questions about exam two? Uh, let's see. What do I want to do here? I mean, there are SI sessions Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, let me email Jen and see whether or not we can run an SI session either before class on Monday or maybe Friday afternoon or something like that. So I'll send an email out to you. Let me write myself a note here. To to see whether or not we can get an SI session together Friday or Monday before the exam. I mean, I'll be in my office Monday before the exam, but uh, maybe we can get a little bit more work done on this stuff. Okay. All right. Remarks? Yeah. So, here's what's up tonight. We are... Well, we're going to continue on this second major theme, this new topic that we introduced last Wednesday, this topic called rings, and we'll continue on that, well, definitely through the end of the semester. So let me remind you what a ring is, and then we'll continue looking at not only examples of things that are rings, but various properties that certain rings possess. So a reminder of the definition, and I'll write it out in shorter hand or using more concise notation than I used on last Wednesday because, well, we've already seen the idea. In effect, a ring is a set with two binary operations, one typically denoted by plus, the other typically denoted by dot, where the following three things are true about the set together with these two binary operations. First, that if you look at R together with the plus operation, that you get an abelian group. That's a very strong statement. Here's a very weak statement that R together with the multiplication is an associative binary operation. And third, I'll just write di distributive laws. Uh, of dot over plus, as usual. So a ring in general is simply a system where you've got two binary operations. The good intuition about rings is you know a lot of them. The integers, the rationals, the reals, the complexes, the n by n matrices, the zn's, the I mean, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the functions from the reals to the reals. All of these are rings because in all of those settings, typically the set together with addition was an abelian group. And typically we were able to combine things by some other operation called multiplication, but we, we never got a group in that sense. That's okay here. I don't really care if the underlying set together with the multiplication is a group or not. All I care about is that if you multiply two things in the underlying set, you get something back in the underlying set, that's binary operation, okay, and that the multiplication is associative, but that'll be the case in all of the systems that we look at here. Okay, so big examples, lots of them. Examples, you know, Z together with its two operations, the rationals, the reals, the complexes, the 
two by two matrices. In fact, I made this observation on Wednesday, but I sort of made it under my breath and I'll make it a little bit more prominent now. It turns out, folks, start with any ring you want. I don't care if it's the real numbers or the complex numbers or the rational numbers or the integers. It makes sense to talk about the two by two matrices where the entries in those matrices come from the underlying ring. Well, how do you add and multiply in the ring of two by two matrices over a ring? Answer, exactly the same way you'd do if it was integers or rationals. Or, because matrix multiplication involves only two processes, addition and multiplication, and those are precisely the two processes that you get in any ring. So I don't care if here you put R bracket X, the ring of polynomials. I don't care if you put functions. I don't care if you put the complex numbers. I don't care. Heck, I don't care if you put the three by three matrices over the two by two matrices or something like that. So it doesn't really matter what appears in the parens here. In fact, it doesn't even matter what size it is. The n by n matrices over any ring you want. The ring, oh, here's another one that we'll spend a lot of time looking at. The ring of polynomials, that's what our bracket x stands for, where the coefficients are taken from any ring you want. The collection of zn rings where the operations are so look, you know lots of systems where you can add and multiply. You can add and multiply real valued functions. We know what that means. You can add and multiply matrices. I don't care what the underlying system is. You can add and multiply polynomials. I don't care what the underlying scalars are. So there's lots of different systems where this happens. And in each case, it produces a ring. So we have example upon example upon example of rings. Now, what makes rings interesting it's fair to say that what makes rings interesting is trying to determine how rich or how much structure there is in the multiplication side of the ring. So the intuition, folks, is that the addition side of the ring is sort of uninteresting. It's as nice as you could want it to be. Not only is it a binary operation to do the addition, it's actually an abelian group. But what can differ between various rings is, for example, how close the multiplication comes to giving a group. Now, what we showed last time is if you look at the thing called zero, in other words, the thing that behaves as the additive identity, which is zero, 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 all zeros, the zero polynomial, the, well, you know, it comes in slightly different notations, but it all stands for the thing that you add to anything else that doesn't change the other thing. What we showed is that if you choose to take that thing and multiply it by anything else in the ring, you always get zero back. In particular, you never get, if there happens to be an identity, you never get one back. So if you've got a zero floating around, then this thing is never a group. So the question, is R with dot a group, is a complete non-starter. The answer is no, it's never a group. But what becomes interesting, especially in the examples that we already know, is if you take the underlying set and you throw the zero thing out, you might get a group. So let's just go through this list and at least intuitively ask this question. Suppose you take any one of these examples of a ring and you throw out zero. Question is the ring throw out zero together with dot a group? Well, at least it's an associative, ooh. Now I've got to be a little bit careful. If I throw zero out, is it the case that I even get a binary operation? I might not. Let me give you an example. If I look inside the ring Z6, so 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, there's Z6. It's easy to write down. Now I'm going to ask you to throw zero out. And the question is, are the elements that remain, there's only five of them, do those form a group? The answer is no, because the thing never even gets off the ground. It's not even a binary operation. Here's why. If I take two and three, those are certainly non-zero elements, and I multiply them together, I get zero. I get something outside the set that I've just looked at. So boy, in some situations, it's a disaster. But in other situations, for example, if I look at Q and I throw out 0, well, let's see, if I take any two non-zero rational numbers and multiply them together, all right, at least I get a non-zero rational number. Just not two non-zero 
rational numbers multiplied together do non-zero. Oh, so at least it's a binary operation on the set of non-zero elements. And now we can ask, all right, is it the case that if you form, well, let's see, is there an identity in there? Yeah. Is it the case that if I hand you any non-zero rational number that you can find something that multiplies to give the identity? Sure, just flip it over. So we've seen sort of you know, one end of the spectrum to the next. There are situations where it doesn't even make sense to ask whether throwing zero out leaves a multiplicative structure that gives a group because you don't even get a binary operation. And on the other side of the coin, not only does it make sense to ask, do you get a group if you throw out the zero element? In fact, you do. It's pretty easy to show. Okay, so the big, let's call this philosophy, philosophy. It's this. Uh, how nice is R with dot? Note that it's never a group. It is never a group. And the reason it's never a group is because the zero element, zero will never have a multiplicative inverse. That's what we showed last time, since we showed last time that 0 dot r equals r dot 0 equals 0 for all r and r. In particular, regardless of what element of the ring you write down, if you combine it with 0, you never get 1 because you always get 0 back. So here's the next reasonable question to ask. Reasonable question to ask, how about Look at R, throw away zero. Remember what that notation was? Star with dot. Is this a group? And let's see. R, just to remind you, just for emphasis, this is R, throw out zero. Answer, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Sometimes yes. Sometimes no. Give some yes examples. Example, if I take Q rationals, then the question is look at the non-zero rationals together with multiplication. Does this form a group? Turns out, folks, we've seen this many times and we know the answer is yes. But the point is, I've now viewed Q as a ring. I'm now asking you to forget the addition operation for a minute. Find inside Q the zero element, throw it out, and ask what's left over. Well, in order to verify that this is a group, technically what do we need to do? We need to step zero, show that dot is a binary operation. Dot, binary operation on Q star. OK. Why? Because the product of two non-zero uh, rationals is again non-zero. Is again non-zero. What do you want to call that? The law of zero products or something like that? Property of integers. However you want to justify that. If you take two non-zero rational numbers and you multiply them. In other words, when you combine two things via that operation, if you take two things from this set, you get something back in this set. All right, associativity, yeah. Associativity, not an issue. Check. Identity, sure. It's one divided by one, or just better known as one. And then inverses, sure. Sure, if I hand you A over B, and it's in Q star, not in Q, but in Q star, that means by definition A is not zero because the, the fraction isn't zero. And because A isn't zero, it means that A over B inverse exists. And I'll tell you what it is, it's B over A. And that's also in Q star. The reason it's in Q star, the reason this isn't zero is because by definition of rational numbers, the denominator of the expression that you started with wasn't zero. All right, so we've just shown that if we start with this particular set together with two operations plus and dot, and we just focus on the dot operation and we throw zero out that we actually get a root. In fact, we get an abelian group.
because it turns out multiplication of rational numbers obviously is commutative. Okay? Similarly, if I start with this ring and play exactly the same game, if you look at the collection of non-zero reals under multiplication, you get a group. If I look at the collection of non-zero complex numbers under multiplication, I get a group. In fact, they're both abelian groups. That's fine. So the three examples that I listed out here turn out to be relatively special. Let's look at a few more examples. Like, how about Z? So these are groups. And I'll put in parentheses abelian groups. Next level of example. Example, let's look at the integers. So here's the question. If I look at the non-zero integers together with multiplication, is it a group? And the answer is no. We observed that way back when. But let's see what's preventing it from being a group. Well, in order to determine whether or not something is a group, step zero is determine whether or not the given operation is really a binary operation on the set. Is it the case that if you take two elements of this set, in other words, two non-zero integers, and you multiply them together, do you get another non-zero integer? The answer to that question is yes. So is dot a binary operation on z star? The answer is yes. So at least the question gets off the ground. It makes sense to decide whether or not z star with dot is a group. Associativity, of course, is fine. Check. Identity, is there some special integer with the property that, of course, it looks like one? How about inverses? Well, no, that's where things fall apart. Turns out not every element has an inverse. In fact, most elements don't as an inverse. And the element, for example, 2 doesn't have an inverse. Does not not have an inverse in Z star. It obviously does in Q star and in R star and in Z star, but there's no half is not uh, one half not an integer, that's the key. Okay. So, not a group. But I'm going to put in parentheses, but at least a binary operation. All right. It turns out, and I'm not going to go through all the details, that there is another collection of elements on this list that behave like the integers do. And what I'm going to do is look at a specific example, because this is the one that I looked at last time. I'm going to look at the specific example of the collection of polynomials where the coefficients that I'm going to ask you to use come from the real numbers. So it turns out, if I look at this ring, the ring of polynomials with coefficients in the real numbers, Oops. Write this down in the same form that I had the other ones. So here's the ring that I want you to consider. And now the question is, if I look at the collection of non-zero polynomials under multiplication, what do we get? Well, let's see. Step zero is to make sure that multiplication of non-zero polynomials is a binary operation. In other words, if I take two non-zero polynomials where the coefficients are coming from the reals and I multiply them together, well, you always get a non-zero polynomial. So the fact that this is a binary operation is okay. Again, think about it. If you take two non-zero polynomials and you multiply them together, in fact, I'll convince you that the result has to be non-zero. In effect, it's just the degree argument. If you hand me two non-zero polynomials, tell me the degree of the first one. Maybe it's three. Tell me the degree of the second one. Maybe it's four. Hey, if you multiply a degree three times a degree four, you can't get the zero polynomial. In fact, what you get is a degree seven polynomial. So it turns out there is 
It turns out, and we'll use this terminology later, there's what we'll call a law of zero products that acts both in the integers, if you take two non-zero integers and you multiply them together, you get a non-zero integer, in the same way that, it, that, in the same sort of way that we see happening inside the non-zero polynomials with real coefficients. If you take two non-zero polynomials with real coefficients and you multiply them, you get another non-zero polynomial. And in fact, for those of you that have taught an algebra course before, when you use that a lot, I'll show you where that happens later on. Uh, associativity, sure, multiplication of polynomials is associative, no big deal. Is there an identity for the multiplication? In other words, is there some special non-zero polynomial with the property that if you multiply it times any other polynomial, it doesn't change the other polynomial? Sure, it's typically called this. It's the polynomial of degree zero that has one as its constant term and zero as its x term and zero as its x squared term. So I'm asking you to view the number one here as a polynomial. How about inverses? That falls down. For example, here's a polynomial. Does it have an inverse? In other words, can you multiply this polynomial times something to give you this? If your answer is one over x, okay, well, that's correct, but one over x isn't in here. This means the collection of all polynomials, non-zero, that have real value coefficients. Polynomial, by definition, means a constant plus some real number times x plus real number times x squared plus da 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 da. You don't get to use negative exponents in the definition of polynomial. So this thing has no inverse, at least in r bracket x. It's the same sort of issue as with the integers. You at least get off the ground. Multiplication turns out to be a binary operation on the set. It turns out to not give a group. And in both cases, it falls short because, well, various elements lack inverses. All right, now, the sort of third piece of the puzzle, or the third flavor of rings, are rings in which when you throw out the zero element, you don't even get a binary operation in a given set. So here's sort of the third flavor of example. Example, let's look at, how about Z6? That's the one that I just talked you through. Let's write down the details. So if I look at Z6 star, in other words, throw out zero with multiplication, then this not even a binary operation. Not even a binary operation. So the question, does it form a group, is a non-starter. Why not? Because, for example, if I take 2 times 3, each of these individually are non-zero elements of Z6, but I get 0, which is then not in Z6 star. Not a group. Similarly, if I look at the, let's say, the 2 by 2 matrices over the reals, if I throw out 0 and look at the multiplicative operation, not even a binary operation. Not a binary operation. Is it possible to take two non-zero matrices, and multiply them together and get 0? Of course. I mean, just for example, uh, there's a whole lot of different examples you could use, folks. Not in M2 R star. Hmm. Okay. I'm going to give you some words. The words, in effect, correspond to these three flavors of rings. In some cases, you get when you throw out the zero element, you get a group when you look at the non-zero elements under multiplication. Sometimes, even though you don't get a group, you at least get a binary operation on the non-zero elements. And sometimes you just, I mean, sometimes it sort of falls apart and you don't really get much of a structure. There's just too much, too much bad, I don't want to say bad stuff. There's just too much stuff that winds up being zero 
to allow multiplication to be a binary operation with non-zero elements. So here are some words. We sort of uh, describe each of these uh, three types of rings with some words. Let me give you the words. The first is skew field. Skew field means this, folks. A ring is a skew field means that a ring for which if you look at the non-zero elements, a ring R for which take the non-zero elements and look at the structure under the multiplication is a group. Now there's two other words that are germane here. This is also called, this is another phrase, nah, I won't say one is more standard than the other, but they're certainly both used in the literature. This is also sometimes called a division ring. Intuitively it's a ring in which division always makes sense as long as you've thrown out zero. So there's the first phrase, if, and this will be an important example, if it's not only the case that when you throw out zero and you look at the structure on the multiplication that you get a group, if you happen to get an abelian group, in other words, if the multiplication is commutative, if dot is commutative, in other words, if R with dot is an abelian group, i.e. if R star with dot is an abelian group. Then we call this, then we call R a field. So skew field means that the non-zero elements form a group under multiplication. Field means more. Field means not only is it a group, in fact, it's an abelian group. So that in the three examples that we gave in that first collection, the rationals, the reals, and the complexes, those are all skew fields or division rings, but in fact, they're slightly more. I won't say slightly more. In fact, they're somewhat more. They in fact, are fields because the multiplication in each of those is, in fact, commutative. So, for example, the collection of rational numbers, that ring is a field, this ring is a field, this ring is a field, are fields. Now for one of the homework problems, let's see, that I'll assign tonight, and it won't be due till after the exam, so not to worry, and one of the homework problems that I'll assign tonight, example, You'll do this for homework. No, I lied. You'll do a problem that's essentially identical to it for homework. Instead of square root of 5, it'll be square root of 11 or something like that. Remember, we looked last time at the following ring. The collection of elements inside the real numbers was a subset of the reals. I want you to just look at those real numbers that you can form by taking a rational number and adding it to a rational number times the square root of 5. We spent a little while last Wednesday showing that at least this thing is a ring. Turns out, not only is it a ring, this is actually a field. And you'll show that for homework. This one's sort of interesting. All right, well, you have to make sure that if you throw zero out of this set, that the resulting set together with multiplication is a group. And as we've looked in these examples, step zero is to show that at least it's a binary operation. Well, folks, I don't care what 
two real numbers you take, whether they're in this set or not, if you take two non-zero real numbers and you multiply them together, you get something non-zero, so that's a non-issue. So the fact that you get a binary operation on S star comes for free because things sit inside something that already have that property. The question then will be, all right, is it associative? Yeah, that's no problem because the multiplication is happening inside reals. I already know that that's associative. Does this particular set have an identity element? In other words, is, well, the question is, is one in here? Well, yeah, because one is of the correct form. It looks like one plus zero times the square root of five. There's one. So I found one in there. Now the real question is, does every element in this set have an inverse under multiplication in the set? And that becomes a little trickier. You might say, well, wait a minute. If you're looking at a non-zero element in the set, it's just a non-zero real number. So I'll tell you what its inverse is. One over a plus b times the square root of five. Yeah, but folks, you haven't convinced me that that is in the set. You have to write 1 over a plus b root 5 as something of this form. Can you do that? I don't know. Maybe you can, maybe you can't. I mean, turns out since I've given you the answer, the answer is yes. But just stopping saying, yeah, every element has an inverse. If I hand you a plus b root 5 in this set, here's its inverse 1 over a plus b root 5. I'm completely non-impressed by that because you haven't convinced me that it's in the set. You've convinced me that the inverse is a real number, but you haven't convinced me that it's of the right form. How do you do that? Quick hint, uh, what's it called? Rationalize the denominator. And after a lot of algebraic work, which turns out to have some merit to it, you'll eventually be able to convince me that, that if a plus b root five is in S star then one plus over a plus b root five is also in S star. Do some arithmetic. And it turns out when I hand you this similar question for homework that that will really be the only non-trivial issue that you have to deal with in deciding whether or not that set is a field or not. We've already shown it's a ring, and then showing the other stuff, all except for the last piece, follows directly from the fact that you're just multiplying real numbers. Two non-zero real numbers multiplied together is going to be non-zero. Associativity comes for free, that the identity element is in there comes for free, and you just have to show that inverses are of the correct form. All right, so that's the first collection of words. Skew field or division ring, and then, more importantly, a field. Uh, it will take us a little while, folks, and we may not even get there by the end of the semester, but we'll get there in the middle of next semester if we can't get there this semester. It'll take a little while to be able to write down an example of a skew field, in other words, a uh, ring where when you throw out zero and you look at what's left over under multiplication that you get a group that's not an abelian group. In other words, it'll be relatively difficult to come up with an example of a this that's not actually that. All the examples that we've written down so far are not only skew fields, they actually are fields. Okay? And the difficulty in doing so is probably going to bubble to the surface by the end of tonight because it turns out that if there are some division rings out there, in other words, if there are some skew fields out there that aren't fields, then they're going to have to be of a very special form. All right. Questions? Comments? All right. Uh, let's see. Do I want to do this next flavor yet? Uh, no. Yeah. Let's do this. Proposition. Proposition. Mm, let me phrase it as a question first. Question. Question. All right. Now it looks like the rational is question. So I'm going to list out a bunch of rings for you. Zn, where n is a natural number. So 
So here's a lot of rings. Z2, Z3, Z4. Z1 technically is a ring. It's pretty uninteresting. It's just zero by itself. Z2, Z3, Z4, Z5, Z6. So I have a whole list of them. We've given an example of a ring on this list, Z6, that's not only not a field, in fact, doesn't even get off the ground. When you throw zero out, you don't even get a binary operation. That was this. So if you ask the question, are the rings on this list fields, the answer is certainly some of them are not. Z6 is a good example of that. But it turns out there are rings on this list that are fields. So the question is, which, if any of these, any of these rings are fields? Quick remark, Z6 certainly is not. See this computation? Because, yeah, heck, if you throw out zero, then not only do you not get a group, you don't even get a binary operation. But example, let's look at uh, something small. How about Z, yeah, Z3. So here's Z3. And the operation is addition and multiplication mod 3. So if I look at Z3 star together with multiplication, well, I know what that set looks like. It's the set 1 and 2. There are the non-zero elements of Z3. Question, is this set closed under multiplication? Well, let's see. 1 times 2 is 2, and 1 times 1 is 1. 2 times 1 is 2, and 2 times 2 is, is 1, because the operation is mod 3. So 2 times 2 is 4, but mod 3, that's 1. So in fact, here's what the multiplication table looks like. 1 times 1 is 1, 1 times 2 is 2, 2 times 1 is 2, and 2 times 2 is 4 mod 3, which is 1. Mm -hmm. So we get a group. In fact, we get a BA group. So, field. Z3 is a field. Mm -hmm. So one is, one isn't. Right. And I'll sort of cut to the chase here. So the question is, can we distinguish between the integers, the n values, that produce fields versus those that don't produce fields? And the answer turns out to be yes. It turns out, proposition, that Z sub n is a field precisely when, precisely when n is prime. So Z3 is a field, because 3 is prime. Z4 is not a field, because 4 is not prime. Z5 is a field, because 5 is prime. Z6 is not, Z7 is, etc. I'm going to prove this by the end of today, I think, but I'm not going to prove it right now, because we need to introduce one more term, one more definition, and then we look, need to look at uh, properties of Z sub n, where n is prime, that somehow get us to that definition. And then we'll wind up being able to, to move from that definition back to the definition of a field. So proof soon. But if nothing else, one piece looks like this. Piece is easy. It turns out that if n is not prime, then if you look at uh, not a binary operation. So if I start with a number that's not prime, well, the question is, is it possible for, when you throw out zero, the corresponding set together with multiplication to be a group? And the answer is, not even a chance. doesn't even get off the ground. Not only is it not a group, in fact, you don't even get a binary operation. And the reason is this. Well, wait a minute. If n isn't prime, 
So if n is not prime, then what does that mean? It means you can write n as, let's call it a times b, where a is less than n and bigger than 1, and b is less than n but bigger than 1. So it means to be not prime, that you can actually factor it well, what does it mean to say that the integers a and b are each less than n? It means that they're not 0 in zn, but then uh, a is not 0 and b is not 0 in z sub n because they're each less than n and bigger than 1. And the only way you can be 0 in z sub n is if you're a multiple of n. Rephrased, a and b are each in zn star, but if we multiply a times b, we get n. But that's 0 in zn, uh, in zn, so a times b is not in zn star, so we don't even get a binary operation. So one direction is clear if you start with a non-prime, in other words, a composite that you're going to use as your base, use as your modulus, then you never get a field. The slightly more difficult question is, all right, if you start with a prime, why do you get a field? And that's the slight little uh, tangent that we have to go off on for 10 minutes or so. So the converse will be soon. So what have we done so far? We've, we've sort of given one end of the spectrum, which is if you start with a ring and you throw a zero out, it might be the case that you wind up with a group. Think intuitively that all of the non-zero elements of the underlying set have multiplicative inverses, because that's typically what gets in the way here. Uh, secondly, we showed some examples that don't even get off the ground, but there's this sort of middle ground, the ground that includes, for example, the integers, or the ground that includes the polynomials with real coefficients, the situations where if you take two non-zero things and you multiply them, at least you get something non-zero. So you get a binary operation, but that somehow maybe you don't have enough inverses. And we're about to give those types of rings a name. So the new words or verbiage is this, what we're going to call an integral domain. Integral domain. This is a type of ring. Is the situation is a ring R for which, let's see. Well, I mean the silly statement that bless you that I have to put in is first of all that R has unity. In other words, that it has something that we identify as one. Secondly, that R is commutative. You might say, well, wait a minute. R has two binary operations on it, addition and multiplication. Which of the operations are you telling me is commutative? Folks, there's not an issue here because always the plus operation is assumed to be commutative because it's always assumed to be an abelian group under addition. So when we say R is commutative, we mean R with dot is commutative. And the key is that when you look at the non-zero elements under dot, that you get a binary operation. And I'll rephrase what that means. In other words, i.e., the product of two non-zero elements. in R is again non-zero. So I've just rephrased what it means to say that the non-zero elements in their multiplication form a binary operation or is a set with a binary operation. That means that if you take any two things in here, you combine them using that, that you get something back in here. Well, we've given We've actually given a lot of examples of these things called integral domains. Good example, the integers are an integral domain. The integers are an integral domain. Uh, the polynomials with real 
coefficients are an integral domain. Yeah, let's see. The integer certainly has a multiplicative identity. The multiplication in the integers is certainly commutative. And we showed that whenever you take two non-zero integers and you multiply them, you get a non-zero integer. The same was true with Paul. But you know what, folks? The same is also true of the rationals. The rational certainly has an identity element. Multiplication certainly commutative. And in fact, I could say more about the rationals. In fact, not only was the rationals with dot a binary operation, it actually turned out to be a group. Hmm. And the same is true of the reals, and the same is true of the complexes. Hmm. Let's see, proposition. Proposition, if R is a field, then R is also an integral domain. If it's the case that when you look at the non-zero elements under multiplication, that you get an abelian group, that's what this means, is it necessarily the case that when you look at R and its non-zero elements under multiplication, that the collection has unity, is commutative, and forms a binary operation? Well, yeah. Has unity means that under multiplication, there's an identity element. That comes for free if the non-zero elements for a group, form a group. Is it the case that if you look at the multiplication, that it's commutative? Yeah, that's the definition of being a field that when you throw out zero, that the multiplication is abelian. You might say, well, what about zero? Folks, zero commutes with everything. Zero times anything is anything times itself, which is always zero. So commutativity with zero is a non-issue. It's not interesting. It turns out to be a non-issue. And third, is it the case that if the non-zero elements with multiplication form an abelian group, that the non-zero elements under multiplication form a binary operation? Of course, that's what gets it off the ground. So the proof is that the ingredients that give R star with dot an abelian group group give enough information implies uh, all three properties on this list of an integral domain. So there are lots of examples of integral domains out there, anything that's a field. These. But it's important to keep in mind, because these are going to be the most interesting rings that we'll be working with, there are many examples of integral domains that are not fields. And the integers is the best example of such a ring. It's a situation where the non-zero elements at least form a binary operation Take two non-zero integers, multiply them together, you get something non-zero. But that not all of the elements have inverses. And the same is true with polynomials over the reals. All right. So every field is an integral domain, but not conversely. There are many integral domains that aren't fields. Huh. So what? Oh, yeah, here's the so what. We're we're going to ask the question, all right, which z sub n rings are fields? Well, what we've just shown here is, in fact, if you have a value of n that's composite, in other words, if n is not prime, and in fact, we've shown not only that uh, zn is not a field, in fact, it's not even an integral domain, then, because you wind up getting and the multiplication not being closed under the non-zero elements. But, turns out, proposition, proposition, if uh, R is an integral domain, and a, B, C are elements in R with A not equal to zero. And you have the following equation. If you have A times B equals A times C, 
then the conclusion is you can cancel B equals C. This is going to be probably the key property of integral domain. So whether or not you happen to be in Q or in R or in Z or in R bracket X, if you're multiplying by something that's non-zero and you're multiplying two separate things called B and C and you wind up getting the same thing out, then B and C had to be the same things going in. Reason, oh look, if A times B is A times C, then subtract from both sides, that gives A times B minus A times C is zero. Now factor, this is the distributive law, A times B minus C is zero. And now stare for a minute at what we've got. We've got inside an integral domain a situation where I've got a non-zero element, it's non-zero by hypothesis, times something equaling zero. Well look folks, in an integral domain, if you take two non-zero elements, you have to get something non-zero. But if the product's going to be zero, it means one or the other of the two things that you've multiplied had to be zero to begin with because you're in an integral domain. But we've assumed that thing's not zero, so the conclusion is that B minus C is zero. So that implies B minus C equals zero, I'll put in parentheses, since R is an integral domain, domain, and we've assumed A is not zero, but if B minus C is zero, that implies B equals C. So the upshot or the nice property of being inside an integral domain is that if you're in a situation where A times C is B times C and you've multiplied by something non-zero, at least you can cancel the A's. And I'd say, well, you can always cancel as long as you start with something non-zero. And in fact, that's not true. So just for contrast, I'll show you that if you're working inside something that's not an integral domain, you might not be able to cancel, even if you're multiplying by something non-zero. Uh, in Z6, if I do 3 times 1, and I do 3 times 3, all right, that's not 0, folks. It's not even 0 in Z6. And certainly, that's not 0. Well, are those the same? Yeah, 3 times 1 is 3. 3 times 3 is 9. But in Z6, that's 3, but certainly 1 is not equal to 3, so you can't cancel in general. Even if the thing that you're multiplying by is non-zero, you may not be able to cancel. But if you're in a situation where you're in an integral domain, then you can. Good. Here's the key observation then, proposition. In fact, Z sub n is an integral domain. if and only if n is prime. And I say, well, that looks sort of like the proposition that we're in the middle of proving. Yeah, in fact, what we're going to wind up doing is this, folks, and we won't be able to complete it tonight, but we will next Wednesday, or we will on Wednesday. This will be relatively easy. What we'll show next Wednesday is if you happen to have an integral domain, and the integral domain only has finitely many elements in it, then in fact the integral domain is a field. So what we're going to do is we're going to show that this, in a situation where we're looking at z sub n, in other words a ring with finitely many elements, turns out to imply that z sub n is a field, and that's what's going to allow us to finish up the proposition that we're in the middle of proving. Okay, proof. Well, the first piece will look just like the piece that we've already written down in the context of uh, showing that z sub n is a field if and only if n is prime. So we'll first start with the contrapositive here. If n is not prime, then we've already seen, then by the previous proof, proof we have that z sub n is not an integral domain. Z 
So that gives us this direction. If zn is the integral to min, then necessarily n is prime. Now, how about for the converse? Now, suppose n is prime. Then what I'm going to do is, well, for about half of you, remind you of a fact from number theory. And for the other half of you, I'll just hand you this property of prime numbers. Then it turns out, then we have, this is usually referred to as Euclid's lemma. Euclid's lemma. Here's what Euclid's lemma says. If n is prime, and that's the situation that we're in, if n divides evenly into the product of two integers, then either n is a divisor of a or n is a divisor of b or both. Maybe both. This is a property of numbers that is specific to primes. It's not true in general. So for example, if 3 is a divisor of a times b, the only way that can happen is if 3 is either a divisor of a or a divisor of b to begin with. It's not true for primes. For instance, 6 is a divisor of 3 times 4, because 3 times 4 is 12, but 6 is neither a divisor of 3 nor a divisor of 4. All right, so why is this helpful? Well, look, then hmm, I need to try to convince you that if n is prime, that uh, z sub n is an integral domain. It's not too bad to do. Suppose I have a times b. Uh, suppose a is not 0 and b is not 0 in zn. Rephrase, suppose I start with two elements in zn star. To convince you that zn is an integral domain, I have to convince you that if I multiply those two things together that I get something not 0. We'll do it by contradiction. Suppose a, b is 0 in zn. Contradiction. We'll see what the contradiction looks like. Wait a minute, if a times b is 0 inside zn, what does that mean? It means that a, b is a multiple of n. Yeah, that's what it means to be 0 inside z sub n. It means you're a multiple of n. In other words, n divides a times b. Whoa, but n's assumed to be prime. So we have Euclid's lemma which says if n divides the product, then by Euclid, we get that n divides a or n divides b. Yeah, but if n divides a, that means that a is 0 in zn, or b is 0 in zn, because that's what it means to divide, which is a contradiction to hypothesis. Contradiction, because we assumed that we started with non-zero elements in zn. So what we've just shown is on this list of rings, z2, z3, z4, z5, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the ones that are integral domains are precisely the ones that correspond to primes. In other words, the ones that aren't integral domains are the ones that correspond to non-primes. And this is a good place to quit. Let me give you a homework assignment. As I've mentioned, at least in words, but didn't write down, what we will do next time is use this proposition of integral domains to show that if you start with an integral domain that happens to have only finitely many elements, like z5 or z11 or z13 or something like that, that necessarily you get a field. Okay. Questions? Comments? Sorry about tonight being a lot of words and verbiage, but what we have to do is start building the machines that we're going to use from now until the end of the semester. Okay. Here's home, and this will again be a slightly odd uh, due date. Uh, this will be due two weeks from tonight. So that's Monday, November 5th. Just because you've got an exam between now and then, and I want to give you a little bit extra time to do that. And here's the assignment. In section 18, problems 7 through 22, 27 to 33, 37, 41, 42, 44, 55, and 56. I only want you to turn in three of those, though. 12, 37, and 41. And not surprisingly, I'm going to ask you to change the instructions slightly on each of these. 
uh, number 12, um, actually show the set as a field. So this, folks, is the problem that, as promised, I'm going to ask you to, to do for homework. It's the one that we looked at in relatively gory detail. It'll be a question, let S be a set that looks like A plus B times the square root of 5, blah, 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 blah. So as a field, the remark is the only real work is showing that inverses work. The only real issue is showing that inverses are of the correct form. Are of the correct form just as I alluded to in class. So don't start proving associativity. Don't prove distributive law or anything like that. All that comes for free because the collection of numbers that you're looking at live inside the real numbers and you already know all those things are true by uh, virtue of that fact. On number 41, what I want you to do here is the result also true in Z6, justify. If it is, tell me why, and if it's not, give me a counterexample. And then in section 19, here's some problems that, of course, I'm going to change the instructions on as well. 1 through 4, 11 through 17, 19, 23, and 29. The turn in problems are 3 and 23. And on three, I want you to use, instead of the polynomial they give you, use the polynomial x squared plus 3x plus 2. That's much more interesting. And on 23, wherever they say division ring, yeah, scratch that and replace it by integral domain. Integral domain. All right. I need to write an algebra book someday. <laughs> at least, at least I'll get all the, I'll get all the statements of the problems the way they should be. All right. And again, that'll be due two weeks.